Well, hello there, my linguistic spirit, spirits and philosophers. You're uh, entering into the world of speculative philosophy. Uh, this one is titled 31, uh, Sessions of Spirit, Wittgenstein, There Are No Truths. Um, maybe you're a big Wittgenstein uh, fanatic. Maybe you recognize the profound truth of his philosophies. He was a tremendous mind. Um, but we're going to sort of do a comparison with Hegel today. And we have quite a bit of development by this point, but you can come in at any, any of these uh, sessions because they kind of circle back on themselves. And Wittgenstein was one of the great philosophers who discovered this and it unsatisfied him, but Hegel put it in order. So I'll give you a quick recap and uh, I'm gonna do it in two minutes. So it's, it seems impossible to cover 30 sessions in two minutes, two to three minutes, but let us try. And I hope you find it enjoyable. And if you don't understand it, they're on YouTube. So you can go back and read the sessions if there's one that procures your interest. Um, so let's start. Session one was about Hegel being the greatest philosopher because he sublated and put together about 115 philosophers over 3,000 years of wisdom seeking. The second session is that it was so immense, nobody understood how he did that for the last 200 years. The third session is that once you grasp it in its totality, it blows your mind and allows you to change the whole world, your inner world and your outer world. Session four is that you move past the stereotypes of Hegel by five, grasping the circle of reason, which sounds religious at the end, which six leads you into the sublation of religion as philosophy, not the negation, using seven, a universal logic that we put into analytic notation to win the Nobel Peace Prize, or we're going to try and win it. Number eight, you start this universal logic with polemics, but number nine, that's just the first negation. The second negation is sublation, the truth of it. Tenth is the science of logic, which is a, which is a masterclass in sublation Hegel gives us. Eleventh is that the science of logic is way more profound than people think. It's literally the ineffable speaking itself, which is what we're covering today. Sign. Number 12 is that this universal logic is living. And number 13 is that that's the purpose of life and you liberate everybody with it. Number 15 is that it allows you to feel like you're connected to God. But number 15, as you can say, atheist faith allows you to be connected to yourself and your inner child. Number 16 is that uh, our guru has been doing this for thousands of years. There's a logic implicit. Um, 17 is that we need to sublate the old mysticism with the new mysticism, scientific mysticism. Number 18 is that the limit of our reason is the limit of our fun. Gurus were fun because they understood this. And 19 is that when you wanna make a point, you do it through laughter instead of just negation, when you're really good. Number 20 is that the ideal philosopher continues to sublate all philosophies um, with this universal logic to number 21, overcome evil, which is just ignorance in religious language. Uh, 22 is that our technologies are in particular knowledge missing this universal logic, which means they're potentially going to be unwisely used like CRISPR and it's very unnerving. And 23, we need to make this logic concrete to everybody using the synchronicity doctrine of philosophies so that we can get wisdom back in control of these powerful particular areas of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> number 24 is about using this in a particular way, in a realistic way, in one-on-one -on -one conversations. 25 says how to do that with religions. And we talk about particular religions, we sublated them. 26 is we sublated its opposite, which is existentialism. Number 27 is we even sublated capitalism, socialism, and communism to overcome this existential crisis that we're experiencing worldwide. Number 28 was a session about sublating Buddhism as sort of this atheistic religion, has this kind of speculative feel to it. And that led us to absolute uh, atheism. And we sublated that too. And then 30 is that we we sort of show that you, this concrete concept of God, concrete, absolute logic, absolute atheism, um, it's all just you tied into the truth of reality through this essence of who you are, which is the science of logic again. So this leads us to session 31. And um, there's a summary paragraph to give you a sense of the essence of this session. And I'll just reread the title today and say, you know, 31 SOS has a double meaning. It can mean sessions of spirit, but it can also mean save our souls, which just means that philosophy is supposed to be practical, pragmatic. You're supposed to change the world with it. It's a part of your being in the world. And Hegel does that. He gives you the theoretical, the practical, and he sublates those two into a free spirit. That's what it means to be free. So of course I say Wittgenstein with an arrow, 
pointing to there are no truths. So he in some ways implying it feels like there's this thing to language that doesn't feel satisfactory. And he gives this kind of diagram here of a duck rabbit. And you can see it in both ways. And it's flipping back and forth in your mind. Uh, and he says, this is the problem with language. It's how you use it. But I would say Hegel also says it's how it's using you. <laughs> um, I think uh, Victor Stein also says something like that. <clears throat> he says, well, we're getting to that. So here's the summary paragraph. It goes, now that we have united all existentialists, their societal structures of emptiness, a developed emptiness into absolute atheism and atheism into the concrete absolute, we discover the reciprocity of all these modes of reason. The truth, uh, the true revelation is the circularity of genuine reason and its mystical nature as speculative. Wittgenstein, in his tremendous force of thought, began grasping the circularity in his discovery of language games, which ultimately led his mature thought to abandon all hope of any coherence model that was free of paradox and contradiction. Hegel, however, realized the true nature of language before Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein ended up reaching the same limit Kant did when in the judgment, Kant could not eliminate the self-reflexivity of the pure eye judging itself, much like how a language game is not free from divining itself, and so all hope of objective meaning is lost. Kant too said that such need of the pure eye to judge itself presupposes and assumes that it already exists to judge itself. Kant considered this a great inconvenience. Hegel did not. It transcended this limit of realizing that the circularity of the nature of all things was not an inconvenience or point of despair, but the very truth about the nature of reality itself. All things are inherently self-grounding and simultaneously coherent with their opposites in speculative unities. And He's still reading the first paragraph. Which we went over together. Resolved by grasping the full circularity of philosophy in all its ideal moments as the logical coherence that is. I won't get guess till we're coming home. Game, the science of logic. Genuine reason grounds language games in pure being, and nothing could be more convenient. Okay, so now he's going to talk. So oh, I think you're, uh, somebody's got their mic on. Um, if you could please mute that. I guess if I'm the host, I could try and do it, but um, let's get into the notes. It's saying a lot. There were kind of fancy words, and there's some dialectical reversals. Um, but I'm going to try and do uh, a decent job justifying Wittgenstein while also pointing out what I think Hegel would have said his limit was. Showing the notes now. Look how nice this hangs up here. So uh, I'm not sure where the, the sounds come from. Uh, I think David is, has his mic on. David, yeah, if, if you go to the right. picture and hover in the up right hand corner, there, you'll see three dots and, and just press that button. And well, well, it doesn't do it on mine, but it should give you the mute option. I'm on the phone. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll try. Okay. I think it worked. Oh, not quite. Um, I think it works. Okay, David, thank you. All right. And continuing on. So last session, we're sort of building something here, right? So last session, we talked about, you know, does our language shape or get in the way of our interpersonal sublations of this godness? Uh, can two people speak with uh, two different languages? They're kind of trying to communicate, um, but is language the structure of language itself undermining them? Because as we showed before, it's really just ignorance. It's one-sidedness, and we're sort of speaking past each other based on the level of our realizations of what the universals are. And we're saying, well, actually, there's these weird theories like um, the Worf, Sapir Worf hypothesis, however you say that. Uh, and Wittgenstein kind of repeats something that sounds the same, right? That not only are we using language, but language is shaping us. And its very nature is what the kind of problem is. We will never be able to communicate really clearly. Uh, miscommunication and uh, self recognition will inherently be undermined forever. And it seems like Hegel says the same thing because you can't get rid of the negation. It always becomes, you can never hold something st stable and be in your comfort zone forever, right? There's this uncomfortable way that Hegel is taught and has been taught over the last 200 years where he's the negative philosopher and you'll never escape pain. Most of this is an illusion. But it really seems like it's built in to the very understanding and of reality itself. Is this true? 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 Suffering and pain. 
kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. I don't have access to the mic. Uh, we kind of have another echo going on. Yeah, if, if everybody can mute themselves, it's not Mark, that I would be grateful for that. Uh, yeah, oh, I got you here. I got it, guys. I figured it out. Okay. Um, so this sounds very paradoxical. Language is a subjective thing. It's something we do. It's not what the world is doing. But when you really get very, very deep into it, it kind of feels metaphysical. And we covered in a previous session that Noam Chomsky was thinking that yes, it's subjective too, but there's got it, there's a universality to it because how else, how else do we communicate? How are we evolving into these rational creatures that seem to be progressing in greater and greater levels of sophistication? So Wittgenstein says this in a uh, you know, profoundly coherent and uh, cogent sentence in his Tractatus. And he says, the limits of my language means the limit, limits of my world. And so we, I think he is coming from a more subjective uh, perspective, right? He's not saying that the world itself is what you're thinking it is. It's just that you, your interpretation of it uh, is not true. You're not really grasping the truth philosophically because the limit of your ability to grasp what the truth is is always mediated by language. And so... Where the limits of your language are, the limits of your per per perceiving, it's the limits of your understanding. And Hegel does say something similar. And people say, I just had somebody on the chat say, well, how come Hegel didn't develop a, a language or a, a philosophy or a theory of, of language? Why didn't he develop one? And uh, people know he's, it sounds metaphysical, he's a metaphysician, or he's not a metaphysician, he's actually this clever empiricist and logical positivist. Um, but the reality is it's all, like a theory of language and metaphysics and empiricism, logical positivism. He's doing it all because it's on this circle of reason we keep talking about. Everything actually has truth in its moment. And to be a rational human being means you are sublating the fixities of the moments and putting them into a living, growing unity where they turn into each other. <clears throat> and language. Um, is how we communicate this. But Hegel starts it formally, um, that the kind of language that we talk about, like finite language, starts formally in the philosophy of spirit. And he actually gives it an order. Even the way language develops has a logical order. And he says the, the order is that it goes gestures first. So even your body language, stuff like that, that's technically language. People don't think about that usually. But Hegel says, yep, that's where we start. And then, you know, he didn't know about Darwinian evolution, he knew about Lamarckian evolution, I think. And it sounds like he's against uh, that kind of natural selection, but he's really not. He's actually saying that nature does perform these monstrous experiments, he calls it. But he also says what he's angry about is that it looks random and it's not really doing anything deeper, but it is to him. He says there's this world of pure logic called the science of logic that we're repeating. And it's pure reason coming through nature in sensuous form. And what all these experiments, it's like the randomness and contingency of nature is like performing this clarification process that is just uncovering the universals of this deeper, um, this deeper kind of reasoning. Um, so we, uh, okay, there we go. So he's just discontented that we're making it look arbitrary, but it's really not. There's these deeper, profound thoughts going on underneath that are being purified through this seeming randomness. And language is like that. So we kind of develop from low levels of gesturing. And then it kind of turns into ex more explicit, explicit words. You start representing. So you get intuition and representations, and then you sort of get speaking. And then you kind of get writing. Writing comes after speaking. Obviously, we know that now, more or less. But then he says hieroglyphs kind of come first. They're a more nascent way of writing. And then alphabets come after. And in Egypt, and a lot in Oriental language, he says, the reason why you put hieroglyphs first is because you're emerging out of this pictorial thinking where you're taking things kind of in sensuous concrete chunks where it's concrete, right? The universe isn't made of a bunch of gaps. It is like infinitely connected or else it wouldn't make sense, you know? Um, so it, you are grasping the image of things, the immediacy of things, but you're not able to explicate them. And hieroglyphs was the first way of like taking these chunks and communicating them in these kind of pictures. So it's like particularized pictures. And we're starting to break out of picture thinking, Hegel kind of says, but 
It doesn't really happen in the, in the realm of pure thought until you get the alphabet and you start using grammar and syntax to get a much more refined um, version of pure thought thinking itself through you. And language starts to approximate that. So you can have more refined expressions using these logical, what we call grammar, basically. Um, and this is basically what language is. Language is like the workhorse of logic. That's what grammar kind of is. We're trying to touch on the, the super sensuous logic from the science of logic. We're trying to articulate that coming in sensuous form and it's all in a right order, right? So it looks like it's all speculative and contradictory and it doesn't make sense, but speculative thinking resolves that simultaneousness by putting things in the right order. And we just seen Hegel do it here with language itself, the formal language that we speak as humans. Um, but there's a quote here uh, from the science of, uh, not from the science of logic, but from the phenomenology of spirit, where Hegel is saying when consciousness is first coming into the world and we're, we're going through this process of language, we're starting to make it explicit for ourselves, even if just intuitively at first. He says, it is a universal too that we utter what the sensuous content is. What we say, uh, what we say, what we say is this i.e. the universal this, or it is, i.e. being in general. Of course, we do not envisage the universal this or being in general, but we utter the universal. In other words, we do not strictly say what in this sense certainty, what in this sense certainty we mean to say. The language as we see is the more truthful. In it, we ourselves directly refute what we mean to say. And since the universal is the true content of sense certainty, and language expresses this true content alone, it is just not possible for us to ever say or express in words a sensuous being that we mean. And in the science of logic, Hegel says the very first move you make in the science of logic, once you begin presuppositionally and you, you cancel everything you think you know, is you have pure being turns into pure nothing. And then they kind of go back and forth as the same thing that's different. You can't hold either one stable. He calls it a distinction that's no distinction. It's a distinction that we mean. We just mean to make it a distinction, but as soon as we make it, it turns into the opposite. It's no longer a distinction. And it's this kind of frustrating contradiction that seems to be happening. But he says that's what spe speculative thought feels like. And when we're in sensuous form <clears throat> here in nature, that logic is still continuing through us. When you're thinking to yourself, you are these logical categories doing this back and forth. They're just permutating their dialectic in your contingency. There's like two sides to you. You have this like rational, this irrational caprice as part of the being of nature. And then of course you have your reasonable side, which is the science of logic coming through that. And so you, you can have a choice not to align with this perfect reasoning that's supposed to be going on, but you're kind of realizing it as you go around about. And that this, the process of language itself is the universal language itself is rationality in some way even if you think you have an irrational pigeonhole language or pigeon language you are still trying to communicate universals or else you couldn't share them and that's what he's saying here in the uh in the quote he's saying that you're trying to pinpoint particular sense expressions but when you try to communicate them you can only grasp the universality and remember the universal is one of the three elements of the notion so language is like this precursor to, to philosophy because it's how you're trying to make pure thought explicit to yourself. You always feel it. You're, Hegel says you develop from natural soul to dreaming soul to actual soul to consciousness. So these first stages are you're feeling the concreteness, but it's not really explicit until you reach the notion version of yourself, which is the universal for a universal. It's your object. And you start making pure thought explicit to yourself, starting with language. So that's what he's trying to do here. He's trying to give you the scientific way, the truly philosophical way of talking about language. And he's giving you this weirdness to it. You're trying to say a particular this, an individual, but when you try to do that, it turns into its opposite. It's a universal. You try and say I, you mean this particular I, but when you say I, it's the universal I. All of us are eyes. And you can try and qualify by saying, okay, I mean this I, me I, and you start pointing to try and indicate individuality. But this is built into language, this flippingness. And I wanted to put this quote in here because this is kind of what Wittgenstein is talking about when he's, he's trying to say there's this, there's this truth to language that it 
the limits of your universals are the limits of your ability to make them explicit to yourself. And language is this process of making them explicit in an attempt to understand what is external to you, which seems explicitly other to you, which is the world. But here again, sensuousness rears its ugly head. But of course, in art, we make it beautiful. And uh, it's just that sensuousness takes you away from understanding the universal and the fluidity of the logic because it wants to chop things up in individual bits of sense data. And that's where Hegel starts the phenomenology is with uh, sense certainty. Then perception is kind of grasping, a nascent grasping of the limits of this individuality. You start getting objects, you know, the thing with properties. And then you realize that there's a problem with that. There's an emptiness there. Um, so that's how Hegel, Hegel kind of talks about language in two different ways, right? He's showing you how it's working in your phenomenology. And then I kind of showed you how it evolves uh, in its finite mode in history. Um, but I want to say something really sort of controversial and incredibly profound if you grasp this. It, nobody really teaches Hegel this way. Maybe the right Hegelians might have tried in the religious sense, but I'm going to try and give it to you in the absolute atheist sense, the absolute what religion was trying to do. Like we're more religious than religious, we're the fulfillment of it. So here's a quote about the nature of logic of which language is trying to explicate. It's language explicating itself super centrally, technically. That's what the science of logic is. That's where I'm taking this paragraph from. So he says, the, this objective thinking, objective, then is the content of pure science. Consequently, far, far from its being formal, far from its standing in need of a matter to constitute an actual and true cognition, it is itself content alone, which has absolute truth. Or if one still wanted to employ the word matter, it is the veritable matter, but a matter which is not external to the form, since this matter is rather pure thought and hence the absolute form itself. Accordingly, logic is to be understood as the system of pure reason, as the realm of pure thought. And I'm underlining this word realm because the contentious way of expressing this. It sounds like Hegel is saying that there's something beyond out there that's existing as pure thought. No sensuousness, stuff like that, right? So this realm is truth as it is without veil and in its own absolute nature. What's the veil he's talking about here? Well, it's kind of like what we talked about just now in uh, that first quote from the phenomenology. We're trying to say something about the world, but it's, it's twisting into the opposite. It's, it's not doing what we mean to do. And then Wittgenstein saying the same thing, you know, we're not really understanding the true world. Um, there's like a veil there. There's a, there's a limit there that's inside of us. But when you grasp it well, without that limit, without that veil, you're grasping the pure, accurate linguistic expression of the world, its absolute nature. He's saying that this is what pure thought is, and it's in a realm of its own. He said, it can therefore be said that this content is the exposition of God as he is in his eternal presence before the creation of nature in a finite mind. This is really hard to wrap our heads around. But I think it's uh, in no uncertain words saying that there's an objective realm that you're not there and there's no finite people there. There's no finite mind. He's saying this is happening between our minds and that language process that I just highlighted gestures and hieroglyphs and all that. This is before all that's happening. He's saying not only is it happening between our, before our finite minds develop, it's happening before nature itself exists to give rise to us. He's saying this is before. But of course, we kind of know that this realm doesn't, it's not sensuous, it means it doesn't have any space or time because we take space and time for granted because we are sensuous creatures and our language isn't explicit enough to usually separate the two. And I gave an example in a previous talk that Kant couldn't even do it with geometry. Geometry is spatial. We think it's pure thought, but it has dimensionality to it and dimensionality is spatiality, uh, spatialness. So here it sounds like holy smoke. He's actually saying that the science of logic really is its own thing, doing its own thing. You're not there. And somebody, I, I was communicating this to somebody, uh, this means that language is doing something really profound. We're trying to approximate something that's speaking itself without any time or space. 
And somebody said, no, this is not true. Hegel's doing this thing where it's not a real realm. It's just an aspect of central, you know, it's trying to get this logical positivism to say, no, 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 it's all just nature and it's all our, our heads. And, you know, you can start to approximate objectivity. This is what he's trying to say. But as we know here, this is before nature and finite mind. There's no approximating going on. You're not there to approximate anything. So there's another quote that I went and found to, to kind of give us a better idea of what Hegel's really saying when he means this word realm. Does he really mean a realm beyond, like an actual realm that's kind of complete and doing its own thing? Because let me say this beyond doesn't exist. That's the mistake of the scholastics. That's the mistake of all these abstract notions of God or, or axiomatic thinking. Saying, no, it's imminent, it's always here. So it's gotta be in nature always, right? Here's another quote where he tells us, where he uses realm again. And uh, he says, even inside the realm of nature, we find the same distinction of greater or less importance of quantitative features. So I don't really need to read the rest of the quote. The point here is that he's using the word realm again, but he's now not using it with the supercentrist. He's using it with nature. So now we know what he means by realm. He actually does mean a concrete total in itself. So nature is a realm of itself, and this other place is a realm of itself. They are completely distinct. You can communicate in language that they're, they're not mixing in some way and what's not mixing is this frustrating notion of sensuousness one has sensuousness in it and the other doesn't there's no sensuousness in the science of logic there's no time even there's nothing Hegel purified it for us even past geometry and then nature is all sensuous like pure contingency that's where the irrationality of, of, of our caprice comes from right so he's holding them distinct in a way that almost nobody else I, I don't actually think anybody else keeps clear in a non-religious mode religion tried to do this this was heaven, this was beyond, this is all this other stuff. But Hegel's giving us the scientific version of it as pure thought thinking itself scientifically. The atheist kind of dream is axiomatic thinking that is completely justified and proven in itself in the circle of reason. There's no assumptions here. There's no revelation in the traditional way. We don't have to have a belief here. It's just pure logic thinking itself. And if you're logical, you can grasp it in its purity. But of course, when we try and grasp it in its purity from the realm of sensuousness, we can't really do it. It's hard to explicate it because it's actually doing something that's turning into its opposite contradictorily. So this is the other side, which confuses us, is that even though it's a realm beyond, it's also imminent. So it's actually doing both things at the same time. It is this kind of beyond, but it's also in the world. There's an imminence to it, and that's why you can know it. In fact, that's what you are. You're just the structure of everything. This is all this super logic coming in here, the laws of nature, you know, chemistry, human beings, like, those are all stages in the science of logic. After the science of, uh, after the doctrine of the notion, the last part of the science of logic starts, we get judgment, we get the syllogism, and then we get the object once the syllogism completes itself. And this sounds very weird, right? Aristotle didn't say, say no syllogism thinks itself. No, we're using the syllogism, but no, Hegel is saying, no, the syllogism is thinking itself. And once it's done thinking itself, it collapses into an object. So that's where you get objects for the first time. So all this development for hundreds of pages in the science of logic, there's not even an object to have language about yet. It's like language building itself in non-sensuous form. And so your first actual object, you do get a thing in the doctrine of essence. A thing is less concrete than an object. And before that, you get a something in the doctrine of being, which is even less than that. So you have a something, which is barely anything at all. And then you get a thing, which is what Kant was talking about, which is thing in itself with many properties and all this or trying to do in perception. And then you get the, the, the third part talking about the object finally. And then the objects kind of start in their dialectic hitting each other and working out their dialectic, which Hegel says, this is where mechanism comes in. This is what physics is in the sensuous world. When this logical stage is working itself out with its language, its limits of language, you could say, its logic, its grammar, the laws of physics are, could be said to be the grammar of the world. But of course, we don't mean it in the finite human way. We mean it in this sort of objective, mechanical, logical way as the universals of the universe. So then they sort of work themselves out and then they sublate into chemism, which is what we get in the oceans and you know on planets. And then we start to approximate this kind of Darwinian evolution. But Hegel's saying, no, we're just repeating this divine absolute logic. That's how he's getting away with the speculative interpretation that yes, there's a randomness to evolution. So Darwin, Darwin is right, but it's not the whole story. Don't cut out this other piece which means you're ignoring this other realm. It says this actually exists. We just can't, do, we're terrible at putting it into language. The limit of our language is li literally the limit of grasping the universals from the science of logic. That's literally the limit of your sense making. It's the limit of your fun, like we uh, talked about before. It's the limit of your friendships. It's the limit of your love, the limit of your self-recognition in the world. 
the limit of your philosophy and the limit of your wisdom. It's all the same thing, just reason articulated through these universals thinking themselves. Um, so this is hard to grasp. Uh, it really sounds like, you know, it sounds like maybe religion was right, right? But it's, it's, it's in scientific kind of form. He's not, it's not like you have to believe in somebody else telling it. You can think it for yourself. This is the point of the Ubermensch. This is the existentialist moment. You have the freedom to do this or not. And he says, if you're really logical, though, and you're a concrete atheist, you have to do this or else you end up in conditionality with your opposite, which is religion and revelation. You're just saying things are obviously logical and not justifying them. <clears throat> okay, so I hope I did a good job there. Uh, this really clarifies once and for all what Hegel really is. He's a metaphysician and he's a empiricist. There it is. Here's the metaphysical part that's really hard. So religion's like, yes, finally our truth, you know? Um, but of course, Hegel says, well, how do you know about this world? You learn it through nature. So you're in the world, right? Heidegger's being in the world. You are pulling the universals out, like Aristotle was saying, through the sensuousness, and you can err. So Hegel did a really great job trying to create the first version of the science of logic, and it, he created the first loop. Um, so there is a way to do this wrong, but Hegel claims to have done it right. He grasped the method. So our language is really tricky because of this going on. You're not even, you know, this is why language kind of can speak you. It's coming through you, but you do have this freedom from it. You don't have to follow this pure thought thinking itself, except in mechanistic form and then some of the prior stages. Like you are still a mechanical being, but he says you are the, the miracle. The fact that your consciousness is pure thought coming into itself in sensuous form for the first time. It's unhinged in some way. It's free to move in sensuous form in the inner world, right? but it's only in the inner world. You're actually returning to this objective world in a sort of finite form. And the only way this is possible is through the cunning of reason because you already know everything at some point of absolute spirit on the circle, right? So the only way to not know something is just to let yourself freely go into unknowingness by kind of turning into this indeterminacy, which returns you back to the beginning of pure being, but from the positive. Um, really hard to to approximate this in ordinary language because it's finite but koans in buddhism we saw really tried to get us over ordinary thinking all the great minds were grasping this and Wittgenstein was such a great mind that even without reading hegel he claims never to read hegel he was grasping the speculative nature of thought he was saying that there's these criterion that are kind of undermining themselves and it's all kind of arbitrary in a way it's like what we make it's like this existentialist meaning making he was really at the summit pointing out russell's kind of russell's paradox and you know these things don't really make sense they're doing the self-reflexivity. Okay, I want to spend some time on that because it really is hard to digest. Uh, it's really, you know, it's incredible actually. Um, you can try and dismiss it, but you know, when you think it through logically, I think it would be hard to logically dismiss it. But anyway, let's say that's true. That's how Hegel looks at where language kind of starts coming from. And that's why language has this kind of like speculative nature, like that duck picture, that duck rabbit. That's you seeing it in, you think, subjectivity, but it's actually the categories trying to make sense of the world. Um, so he says it's even stranger. He says the reason why we don't normally grasp this in language is that we don't ever think to apply truth criterion to the categories themselves. And he says you can actually order the categories because they grow in a plant-like way. There's actually an order to the categories, whereas mostly we don't think that the, the categories that we're using to make sense of the world, they themselves don't have a logical order. It's not like you start with the first one and it goes to the second one, but it does. And here's Hegel saying, you know, to ask if, cat if a category is true or not must sound strange to the ordinary mind. For a category apparently becomes true only when it is applied to a given object. That's sensuousness. You have a sensuous object and you apply your thinking to it. That's the correspondence model of truth. There's a fact in the world and your categories are just trying to approximate what you're seeing. <clears throat> And then he said, apart from this application, it would seem meaningless to inquire about, uh, inquire into the truth. But then he's saying, no, the truth is, at the end here, he says, it is agreement of thought content with itself. There is no sensuous object in the science of logic. The content is just the form of the pure thoughts. Again, it's just the pure thoughts thinking themselves. It's like, how can you have a pure thought agreeing with what it's supposed to be as a pure thought? That's why you need the order. That's why you have to be speculative and use sublation 
to create the abstract opposition that sublates into the next category. That's a connection. That's a connection that is no connection. So pure nothing, pure becoming literally turn into pure or pure nothing and pure being turn into pure becoming, which turns into pure determinate being. And then starts up again. It's connecting pure thoughts in what he calls their notions. And the notions are the abstract universal, the particular, and then the concrete universal, which is the individual. And he's just doing this. That's the whole science of logic. It's the master class and sublation we talked about before. Uh, but he's saying that all that's in agreement here is just the, the movement of the categories with other categories. It's really, you would never think to do this. That's his point. We, nobody has ever done the science, nobody has ever, ever created the science of logic, never mind in the super sensuous realm, because nobody could get out of this as, assuming this sensuousness, this, this automatic taking for granted of pure thoughts that we use every day. You never think to question them. But he says this is what he had to do to get to this truth criterion on this super central super centrist content so we can figure out clearly how we're using language and how language is using us so hegel is saying here it is difficult Wittgenstein is picking on the true nature of thought which is hidden in language it really is the limit of your your ability to make sense of things um okay so i'm going to move on here um to, to Wittgenstein's next principle. And he says, wherefore one cannot speak, therefore one must be silent. And there's this kind of efficacy to Wittgenstein's language. He's just great to read, at least easier to read than Hegel, right? Um, but of course, this, is a, this has truth to it. And we've seen it in an earlier session. Look at point eight here. We covered this in session of spirit number 11, where we said it was, the, we're putting the Tao into logical not notation, but that's a contradiction, right? Because anybody that studies Zen uh, Buddhism knows that you can't put the Tao into language. It's if you try to name the Tao, it's not the Tao because it has a finiteness to it, and the Tao is supposed to be infinite. That's what God is. That's what all these types of things are in the past that are beyond. Um, but this is basically Wittgenstein's thing, his own version of it. It's like, if you can't put it into words, if you can't put it into language, you have to, you can't say anything because you have to use language to make things explicit to yourself. To even think, you need to do this. Um, of course, we get around that. And we show how the ineffable, ineffable thinks itself in the science of logic. It's sheer indeterminacy. This indeterminacy is just pure being, right? The very first category, the presuppositionless category. Through its own inward nature, just by it thinking itself, reaches a, an internal contradiction that as soon as you try to, as soon as it tries to know itself, it turns into its content, which is nothing. And then it's like, but when you try to hold nothing, there's no real affirmative being there. It's just the thinking of itself that realizes it's empty, it's empty thinking, that then turns back into pure being as the affirmative that's allowing this to kind of happen in an explicit way. There's something there to become external to. And so this is how ineffability, the Tao starts speaking itself. This is how the ineffability of language starts coming out of its own silence to speak itself. But it does it in form, right? Um, because pure nothing is still kind of indeterminate in a way. There's nothing in it. And then it turns into pure becoming, which is the ineffability switching between these two modes of ineffability. And then it just keeps going. That if, there's no real filling that content. It's just like forms are kind of turning into forms. That's the content. Um, so the quote here that I give you to make this point even more deeply comes from the philosophy of spirit. And he was talking about mesmer. So you know when you say I'm mesmerized, it comes from this guy in a, in a, uh, just before Hegel's time and in Hegel's time, his name was mesmer. And he was this guy that kind of made up or invented sort of hypnotherapy and this kind of thing. He was the father of all this. So the quote goes, it has often been said that the correct true thinking is without words. Right, uh, Wittgenstein is kind of saying a version of this, um, not necessarily saying, yeah, I'll say for now he's saying a version of this. Um, so for example, Mesmer in his memoirs uh, concerning magnetism, magnetism reports that he nearly went mad in his attempt to think without words, without language, right? He attempted to imagine himself in the pow pure power of inwardness, which we know as thought, pure thought, uh, of inwardness and attempted to think without words. He continued it nearly to the point of madness. However, knowledge means that I have the word before me 
and a process and, and proceed mindfully in words. So in order to make things explicit in sensuous form, you, you need language to do that. It's the process of making things, the internal explicit, the inwardness. So it's kind of agreeing with um, Wittgenstein that if you can't do that, if you can't make what is implicit, explicit, you can't know it. There's no knowledge there. Knowledge needs to have that second language of, of logic, uh, that second side of logic. It needs to negate itself in the first abstract negation to create otherness, to have externality, so that knowledge can know something determinately. Otherwise, it's just meshed together. You can't make a distinction. And so, you know, that's why he says the first one is a, is a distinction that is no distinction between pure being and pure nothing. Because it's like an other that's not really an other. It's, it's so little there that it's hard to keep them separated. Uh, but I hope this kind of gives you uh, an idea that even these great people like Mesmer who are trying to grasp the world sort of agree with uh, Wittgenstein that language is necessary. But Hegel says there's a, there's a way to speak the ineffable, but you have to grasp the logic first because language is just that process. Okay, so Hegel overcomes Mesmer and overcomes this problem that uh, Wittgenstein is talking about, or at least fulfills it. He's showing that's a moment. Right? It's true, but you can actually go beyond that by sublating. Um, so the next principle of uh, Wittgenstein are these language games. And he has these kind of, I took a summary from somewhere else of these criterion that summarizes his points very quickly. And I just give you some comments in the, uh, in the side here of, of me trying to explain how Hegel would look at this. So the first thing he says is that functional uh, language games give a, a functional postmodern approach um, to explaining how language works between human beings. He's not talking about this logic beyond. So I'm saying that, you know, do we really have postmodernism? It seems like you had the French Revolution kind of come in and usher in abstract reason, but it was not concrete. You get the terror and all this stuff and still fragmented uh, logic, which makes fragmented language, which makes fragmented relationships, which makes fragmented state constitutions, which creates fragmented police states, which makes things really oppressive. So he says they threw out God, which is the concrete logic, the non-axiomatic axioms. Uh, and he's saying we need to put that back in. That's what he's doing. So it seems like we, we consider the separation of church and state sort of as the first moments of real modernity, modern thinking, where we're using science and pure thought to make our decisions rather than super sensuous revelation. Um, but he said something kind of went wrong and he had to come in and kind of correct it. So real modernism kind of stopped with Hegel, in my opinion, but because nobody's really grasped what Hegel said, they're just negating him. We're still only in the second moment of reason with Hegel for like the last 200 years. That first moment of logic, abstract understanding is what Hegel did. He kind of gave us the universals, did it. And now we have everybody trying to understand it in plurality and we're just negating him in the dialectical moment of clarity. So dialectic is just a polemic that is the process of, of clarification, right? And it's making what he says external for ourselves so we can reflect it, put it into this order that makes sense in our language and the principles of our language, in our language game, you could say. So we haven't overcome Hegel. We're still in that negative moment 200 years later. We haven't sublated him. Um, so I think we haven't really experienced true post-modernity because we haven't really experienced modernity yet. So I think we're just in the process of modernity still. That's a, maybe not a true uh, interpretation, but I think it's interesting. Uh, that's why I think our language is still fragmented and our science is still fragmented today. And we got a lot of pain in the world because our culture is based on this type of grammar, this kind of logic. We don't have the universal logic like uh, Frege wanted or Noam Chomsky is trying to narrow in on. Um, but it is functional. Hegel speaks about functions too, that things are functions of other things. You have the implicit becoming explicit through prior moments. Um, they're being transformed. So the second principle is that language statements are not true or false, but bear meaning to the speaker expressing themselves. Um, so Hegel talks a lot about the judgment. The judgment kind of does make things true or false. And he's saying everything that is rational kind of has to be in this form because the notion turns into its own judgment that turns into the syllogism. And anything that is rational or actual has to be in this form. So I kind of think if we read Hegel uh, carefully, I kind of give you a, a quote here. He's saying even plants are doing this. I give you that plant example again. He says the plant is judging itself in this like yes or no kind of way as a sort of growing process of canceling something about the seed and then making it true in the stem and then canceling something about the stem, making it false. The falsity is the immediacy of it. It's just a moment, right? So they don't stay there. The, you don't fixate. You allow the growing nature of logic to continue in sublation. 
which before we talked about is just the plant refuting itself. But to Hegel, refutation is not abstract negation, it's this growing. And our language is doing the same thing. Um, so I don't know if uh, Wittgenstein is necessarily in, a, in agreement with Hegel here. I think Hegel's doing something more profound. Um, but he is right that there is this kind of sloppiness going on that doesn't seem like it could be clarified in these boxes. Um, you make the meaning in some way, but that has to do with your understanding of the categories of pure thought, how much you understand the science of logic. So the next, the next criterion is that in each form of life, language therefore is part of a game and people in each game communicate with each other. So what, he, what I think Wittgenstein means by form of life here is he's just talking about the dialectical stages, right? So every stage has those three moments of logic. If you don't grasp the stage in its pure thought form logically, you're stuck in that game. And the principles of that game come from that first moment of abstract understanding, right? There's no real process. It's like your common sense. It's like all the stuff that came before that's in your subconscious or whatever, you're just taking it for granted that it makes sense because you're reasoning with it immediately. It makes enough sense that you can do it heuristically. But then you start externalizing those. And in the process of realizing what you are now, there's another internal contradiction that takes you to the next moment of language, to the next moment or to the next form of life, the next language game, where the principles seem different. But there's like a repetition happening. The only reason why people can communicate is because they share those universals. If you don't share those universals, you're not in the same game. They don't mean anything to you. So you have to be sort of at that same level. And that's why in Hegel, uh, in the master-slave dialectic, the master is not satisfied by the slaves because they want to have recognition by somebody that's an equal, that's playing with the same universals, has the same sophistication, the same pure thought mastery. So I think that Wittgenstein is hitting on the truth here, um, but Hegel sort of did it, I think, in a more logical form, which underlies the language structure he's trying to communicate. But here's kind of the big kahuna. Um, the next principle is Wittgenstein seems to introduce this concept of coherence that each game has a criterion of coherence, which is only understood in relevance to that game. So it seems like all the other stages before and after seem to be somehow, or at least after, seem to have not, not to make any sense. There's a fragmentariness that happens where people start speaking past each other. Um, there's a criterion that allows people to share those universals in a logical way. Uh, it's like an agreement. And so I went and defined here, you know, of course, Wittgenstein only means all this language stuff in the subjective way. He's not meaning in the way that I talked about at first. We're just saying that that objective world is really what's explaining the weirdness that, that Wittgenstein is trying to explain with the subjective nature of logic. But you can't explain it by staying in only that one-sided mode of subjectivity. You have to have this other side to make sense of where it's coming from. Um, this thing that's constantly eluding us. So what is coherence though? Here's the you know, five definitions of coherence from the dictionary or modern dictionary which is an attempt to grasp the pure thoughts clearly. So it, it says, you know, this coherence is the act or state of cohering. So there's a dialectic right in here. There's a, there's a weird kind of opposition where he's saying it's an act and a state. One is a verb, one is like a noun, right? So there's this process kind of going on. And that's what Hegel says too. He says that real philosophy has that process of thinking that the method that's no method, it's negation, right? Thinking through itself without any of our baggage. It's just following its inner unity. It's 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 uh, it's logic. Um, but there's also a state version, like an essence. So when you do the process properly, it's it has a stable structure. It has necessity as this kind of structure. Um, so pure coherence has a way of thinking coherently, and that things are coherent. Uh, then there's other definition, which is that it has logical logical interconnection and overall sense or understandability. And that's what the science of logic is to Hegel. There's no gaps in it, right? It's all logically moving. There's no assumptions. Don't, there's no axioms that are unjustified. Not even pure being the beginning. We know how we got to that pure being. So it sounds like Hegel is making something incredibly coherent. It's what Wittgenstein is picking on, right? Uh, it seems like he's just talking about that science of logic, and he is with these, this language game concept. The ultimate language game, the ultimate act and state of coherence the ultimate logical interconnection, the ultimate overall sense of understandableness that we're using in language is really just approximating what happened in the science of logic. So Hegel is using two modes of truth here. One is the correspondence model of truth, which is that we're in the natural world and our pure thoughts are just aligning with a fact in sensuousness. And it has to line up. It has to actually make sense of the world. It's just like delusion um, or superstition. 
but then the opposite of the co correspondence theory is the coherence model of truth, which is that in the subjective world, it's just pure thought cohering with itself in its own game. We're not a part of this game yet. Remember, he says before any of that stuff happened. This is like the objective language game going on before language formally exists in our sensuous way. And I think it's really incredible. So he's saying that not only does it have to match up with reality, but it's built, it's showing you something that's coherent in itself. Um, and that's what I think Wittgenstein is picking up on here with this criterion of coherence, but he's only doing it in the stages, right? But Hegel's saying it's the same criterion for all the stages. Uh, and I think that's masterful. But of course, Wittgenstein was a great mind in picking up on this, even in the subjective realm. He's like pushing it to its absolute extreme, right? Um, but uh, anyway, okay, so the next definition is congruity, consistency. Remember, this is science, and science says it has to be systematic or it's chaos. So not only do we have this coherence, but it's a systematic coherence. Um, physics like, is a sensuous way, like all the mechanical laws in the world, the universals, are just approximations of this world, the system. And uh, you get optics and all the phenomena in the world seeming like there's a coherence, there's like a, it makes sense. Things are not jumping in random bits there, except at the quantum level. Um, there's like a, a logic to them. So that's the centrist example. They're not talking about the science of logic, right? They're talking about the science of logic in the, the realm of nature. And then in terms of linguistics ex itself, it's the property of unity in a written text or a segment of spoken discourse that stems from the links among its underlying ideas and from the logical organization development of its thematic content. So of course the theme is logic in systematic order in super centrist reality in its absolute coherence. Um, and the links that it's talking about is the sublating and the abstract negation. So it's the abstract negation negating itself. This is the links. This is the thing that's creating the conceptual links. Um, and the ideas are the stages completed in their three logical moments. So that's why Hegel says each stage, each language game is the absolute, you could say. It's a version of it, but it's just in limited form. So I hope that kind of makes sense that I think Wittgenstein was picking up on this, but Hegel had already done it. He wasn't stuck in just subjective idealism. His absolute idealism is a sublation of that finite idealism of Kant, uh, Wittgenstein, but also of uh, this logical positivism of being in the actual world. And Wittgenstein, I'm just saying, was like he was so extreme that he was noticing this contradiction and it frustrated him right till his dying day. He even had like this reversal at the end. It's all pointless, all meaningless. Like you can't really say anything objective, um, but you can. And Hegel showed that it's actually the nature of languages, this logic. So you have to grasp the logic. So another principle of language games is that religious language is meaningful when used in the correct context of that game, hence believers understand each other. So of course, Hegel has this as a dialectical stage in the philosophy of spirit. He says the game that they're playing is that you come after art and then you're trying to make thought in represented form, half sensuous, half in its truly philosophical form. You're starting to grasp the concrete nature of logic in its pure form. So the universals you use to do that, of course, is what religious, Im religious Im imagery is. The universal is coded and the sensuousness that religious thinking needs to communicate them explicitly. But then philosophy comes afterwards as, as a, a higher fulfillment of that game where the pure thoughts are in themselves with no sensuousness. You're starting to reapproximate this objective world. That's what philosophers are doing. They're rebuilding this world in themselves. They're reacquainting themselves with it. So there's no arbitrariness in a way. They're not fixed by that, that contingency in them. Okay, we still got five minutes left here. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense um, why religious language is like that. Uh, the last criterion is that if one does not understand what another person is saying, it could be deemed maybe as a categorical mistake. And remember, the definition of a category is all the dialectical development that came before. To prove a category that it really exists, you have to use all the categories before it. That's what the real way to define things are. This way we use with the dictionary is the abstract way of like chopping things up and putting them around. But the only way to really prove a word or a category uh, scientifically, truly scientifically, uh, non-axiomatically, that's an axiom, is by starting with pure being and rebuilding that word through pure necessity. So that's why the language games I said in the summary paragraph are not based on this arbitrary self-reflexivity that undermines itself. Hegel actually says, no, there is a formal order by canceling the presuppositions. So all language games actually can be defined. There's an objective meaning to every language game but you have to grasp the true beginning of the science of logic to get the true categories and stop making these category mistakes because we actually have clarity on our words. Okay, so 
I'm telling, I'm saying that to grasp, once you get to this level and you start grasping the super logic, that's creating the speculative nature of language that Victor Shine was touching on, it gets strange. You start knowing what to look for. So I give you these magic eyes, these stereograms. It's kind of like this. You start going through centrist reality, not fixed by it anymore. You start looking for the science of logic, the super centrisness in reality. And it's kind of like looking at these magic eyes. This is kind of what magic is, the cunning of reason that we talked about in the mystical section, in the mystical session back in, I think, 14 or something like that. Um, session 14. You look at this in 2D and nothing comes out. It's like some flowers, you can make some immediate sense impressions uh, in language and all this, but there's something hidden in there and you have to look at it in a special way. And what's in there are three things. Can you guys tell me what the three things are? You can pause the video if you're watching this later, but it's kind of like the logic. If you don't know how to look for the super logic, you can't see it. The world looks like this, it's immediate. But if you know how to look at a, a, at a magic eye diagram like this, um, the, the three things in the image are actually three little deer that are sort of standing above those flowers. There's three deer there. So if I tell you there's three deer, three deer there and you don't know how to look for it, you're gonna think I'm crazy, right? Because you can't see it in ordinary consciousness. You have to look at it with this special philosophical speculative thinking. So Hegel's giving you those glasses to look at the world in this way. But there are three deer in there. Uh, spend some time looking at it, you'll see them. And I give you a couple more. So here's another one. Look at the background. The background changes. The sensuous data can always change. There's an infinite flux of particularity, but it's the same process that you have to use with your brain to see the logic again in the diagram. So in this one, what do you see? Um, I say Jolly Roger, Roger to give you a hint, but it's, uh, uh, well, maybe you can tell me in the comments. Here's another one. This one's tricky because there is not, no actual object in here. It's just distance. So if you know what I mean by distance, it's really difficult because he's creating this, uh, just like the stage of stages of difference. Um, here's another one. I give it away. There's some puppies in there for our dog lovers. Uh, this one gives you a little bit of a hint. Star what? These are for our mega fans. You'll find it if you're a mega fan. Um, and then finally, I, the last one I give you is in honor to the Greeks. There's actually a bust of a philosopher in there. Which philosopher is that bust of? Let me know. Uh, we can start doing this. We did a version of this in uh, one of the prior sessions where we talked about speculative thinking is kind of like the same game over and over again. It's how to make philosophy fun again is you go in the world and you're looking for this invisible thing, but it's not superstition. It is this logical, super logical process. It's the living process itself. So I kind of give you an example of how that rabbit duck thing, uh, that triangle with the frega, the analytic notation, it's pure thought in a speculative way, um, moving in and out of itself. That's what you're struggling with with your language when you're trying to communicate something, but it's turning into the opposite. If you don't understand what you're saying and you're trying to, ch trying to change the world, the path to hell is paved with good intentions because of this, this speculative nature. Once you understand it though, it turns into your practical spirit and you can change the world. Um, okay, so I give you an example of meaning making. Uh, meaning making means mind, making something mine in a way. Somebody else pointed this out too. Buddhism has a version of this like Nibya, Nibbana, I think it's called Nibbana. Um, the cunning of reason, of course, is you not realizing this truth of language. That's why you get lost in it in the beginning. That's why people fight a lot. That's why this is the logic of peace. So if you guys are interested, um, I will kind of go a little bit over since we started late here, but there's a video that says, you know, if you don't think that this cunning of reason, this speculative nature is happening to you, um, watch this video. There's two videos there, but I'm only going to show you one because the other one's like four minutes long. This one's about a minute long. So will you pass the attention test of your ordinary thinking? Remember, you're looking at this. If you don't understand the science of logic yet, the super sensuous, like weird realm, um, this is kind of what your mind is doing all over the all over the place. So we think we're seeing the world objectively. And it's just how much attention the attention stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals. We left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines, and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh and sporty look? Well, not quite. 
okay, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Uh, if you have a hyperintelligence, some people are really tuned into this. So you would have seen the changes going along. But uh, because we think in these abstractions, like when it's going black, that's the limit of your reason. So that's representing the limit of your ordinary understanding. You're seeing the world in these blips because your reason is not connected in the circle, right? It's not continuous. Um, I'm just giving this to you in sensuous form, but there's things being squeezed in that you're not noticing. And so it looks continuous, like nothing is changing for most people. But actually, look, look at where you started. This is what the scene looked like before. This is what it looks like after. The colors have all switched in the background. The car switched what it is. The bicycle switched. Everything kind of switched, and it doesn't look like anything switched. That's kind of like what the cutting of reason is like. And it's kind of like what trying to grasp these language games are like in their speculative nature when there's sort of there's an undermining that's happening. It's happening like this. So not only is your sensuous perception like this, but the way you're thinking is kind of like this too. The categories are moving themselves in some incredible way. But of course, you can go along the, the, the circle of reason. You can say, well, it's still subjectivity, but it's like absolute spirit subjectivity creating and generating the logic before the logic exists. So you get this, you know, it happened before it happened kind of thing. But it's because of this uh, speculative nature of thought. So I hope that was interesting. I hope those magic eyes were in interesting. That's the kind of magic, that rational magic that Hegel says, actually, we have to get back into philosophy because it's fun. Plato was doing it in his dialogue, the back and forth, showing that the contradiction in your position is inherent to it. And you get this irony in the dialogue, which is fun when you get really good at it. But you also learn a lot. So of course, Wittgenstein was grasping this too, which is how he arrived at the duck rabbit uh, thing. He's saying there's this playfulness in the language, but when you want to get serious about it, it doesn't seem like you can get serious about it. But of course, Hegel says you can get serious about it, but it's a lot bigger than we want to think. You have to liberate your mind. You have to think in a truly philosophical spirit. Um, so I give you a couple of examples of how this can go wrong. Um, you know, Wittgenstein kind of is stuck in a little bit of one-sidedness. And he says, you know, philosophy is not a body of doctrine. It's an activity. Actually, it's both. When you do it right, it's both. But it's not dogma. So the process can always change the essence. You know, Hegel is science of logic. He has three doctrines. Right in the doctrine of, uh, right in the science of logic. He has the doctrine of being, doctrine of essence, and the doctrine of the notion. These things are stable as long as you're grasping them, grasping them in their, their necessity. What is not true thinking, what is false thinking, is not going to stay in history because it undermines itself. The illusion, the emptiness that we covered in the Buddhist um, session, it doesn't stay. It doesn't have a, a universal in it. So the process makes sure that you actually have the truth because you can constantly question it. And that's how we kind of get out of the religious mode of consciousness and the dogma. So you can have a doctrine, but that's not dogma. So that's what uh, Wittgenstein is pointing on here, but he's a little bit one-sided. Philosophy is a process. And it is a doctrine. It does result in real tangible truths. But you've got to think them in this profound way. Um, and then Wittgenstein hits the nail on the head that philosophy is about clarifying thoughts. And what he's saying here is that it's a system of elucidations. Um, what he means there is notions. Notions are the lucid, the true way of thinking of things by grasping the universal particular and individual uh, elements of them in the judgment that turns into a rational syllogism. Um, so I give you a couple of examples of how this could go. It sounds like sophism. It sounds like, no, this is a bunch of baloney. So here's Hegel using a bunch of sentences explaining like, oh, this doesn't make sense, right? Saying the self is an I that stands in relation to itself, but it doesn't stand in relation to itself. Um, the copula makes the subject identical with the predicate, but they're not identical. And he says, you know, a difference that is no difference of the pure I with its object. It's its object, but not its object. It's a distinction that is no distinction between pure being and pure nothing. It's an object that is no object. At every stage, once you grasp the speculative nature, you can talk about it in a paradoxical way. And that's what the gurus were doing. But they're just talking about the speculative nature of thought. But there's a way to abuse this. And um, Wittgenstein wanted to end that abuse, I think. He wanted this truth. But the truth is like this. You just have to do it in a system. Um, so tomorrow, so we're going to be talking about the wrong way to go about this tomorrow. So when you engage people in this sort of Socratic, Platonic dialectic, and you're bringing back this pleasant way of doing um, real philosophy, speculative philosophy, genuine philosophy, it's not always going to be pleasant. And it's because people, ordinary understanding will just freak out at this. Ordinary thinking doesn't like this. So um, if you want to get practical uh, in this understanding, you, you want to make sure it's a peaceful revolution. You want to make sure you're grasping this logic in this playful way, the magic eyes, this kind of stuff. Um, you, you can undermine almost any position, but you want to do it in the spirit of liberating people's 
spirits, making the ideal come out of them. You don't want to bring them down because it turns into this, this undermining. That's, that's why people don't like philosophers in today's uh, reality because they seem like just a bunch of sophists. But you can use this to liberate people. And we're going to try uh, practically in the Hegelians Who Want to Change the World Facebook group. Post your questions there. Uh, the practical uh, wisdom quiz tests where your one-sidedness might be. And we try and show two-sidedness and the sublations of that. Um, there's a synchronicity document of philosophies that kind of shows the truth of the universals in each philosophy, why they persisted in history, but how they connect to all the other philosophies using Hegel's science of logic. Then you can get into the technologies, apply this to CRISPR and any other technology that's unwisely being handled right now. The 16 paths of Parmenides is something I was asked to cover today, but I decided I'm going to do that with Adorno tomorrow, uh, in the next session because it helps make sure that we don't get into the horror of dialectic too deeply. Uh, then there's the survey, uh, the universal survey of wisdom, where we're going to find out where we need to sublate. And of course, you want to send the smartest people you know to test this knowledge. I'll try and do this the Socratic platonic dialogue in real time uh, on these live uh, streams. And this is all to kind of create a new community, a new kind of state that doesn't repeat the mistakes of abstract capitalism, socialism, and communism. We're getting to this higher spirit, a new world spirit, not a new world order. But you have to grasp this, this nature of spirit, this evolution of the logic of language. Um, and then we have the universal form of reason, um, where if you can if you can grasp the notion, that's how you kind of get past this problem of like being a language structure yourself, a rational structure. You're not just thinking that you actually are; it's your being. So yes, tomorrow we're going to show the limits of this and how people can abuse it. And um, I, I hope that you come uh, in that session because it's important. And I hope you enjoyed this one. So. Go through your day with a hopefully a new level of clarity um, or at least a little more fun about what the world is really like. And uh, if you'd like, join me in the discussion and um, keep on sublating. <laughs>